This is a lecture on the topic telephone networks which comes under module 2 of the subject digital switching and telecom networks presented by J. Mahesh Kumar working as an assistant professor in MITS Raigada which is affiliated to BPUT. The outcomes of this chapter consists of subscriber loop systems, switching hierarchy and routing, transmission plan, transmission systems and signaling techniques. In signaling techniques we have two techniques in channel and common channel switching. This is an introduction to the topic telephone networks which consists of public switched telephone networks which is called as PSTN or the plain old telephone system ports is perhaps the most stupendous telecommunication network in existence today. There are over 400 million telephone connections and over 60,000 telephone exchanges the world war over. A unique feature of the telephone network is that every piece of equipment, technique or procedure which has evoked in the last hundred years from a number of different giant corporations is capable of working with each other. Compare this fa with the fact that it is almost impossible to interface the first IBM computer with its own latest system. The enormous complexity of the telephone exchange is managed by using a hierarchical structure worldwide standardization and decentralization of administration, operation and maintenance. Any telecommunications network may be viewed as consisting of the following major systems. Those are subscriber end instruments or equipments, subscriber loop systems, switching systems, transmission systems and also signaling systems. This is the topic of subscriber loop systems which every subscriber in a telephone network is connected generally to the nearest switching office by means of a dedicated pair of wires. Subscriber loop refers to this pair of wires. It is unwittingly to run physically independent pairs for every subscriber premises to the net exchange. It is far easier to lay cables containing a number of pairs of wires for different geographical locations and run individual pairs as required by the subscriber premises. Generally there are four levels of cabling which are shown in the figure. At the subscriber end the drop wires are taken into a distribution point. The drop wires are the individual pairs that run into the subscriber premises. At the distribution point, the drop wires are connected to the wire pairs in the distribution cables. The main feeder cables carry a large number of wire pairs, typically 100 to 2000, then the distribution cables which run typically 10 to 500 pairs. The feeder cables are terminated on a main distribution frame which is called as MDF at the exchange. The subscriber cable pairs from the exchange are also terminated on the MDF which is called as a main distribution frame and subscriber pairs and exchange pairs are interconnected at the MDF by means of jumpers. The MDF thus provides a flexible interconnection mechanism which is very useful in relocating cable pairs and subscriber numbers. We discuss about the issues on subscriber loop. From the point of view of economy, it is desirable that the subscriber loop lengths are as far as possible so that a single exchange can serve a large area but two factors limit their length that is first one is signaling limits it consists the current delivered should be high enough and second one is attenuation limits that is the resistance of the cables increase in proportional to the length of the cables as we have seen the table which is given the DC signaling is used for subscriber lines. A certain minimum current is required 
to perform the signal signaling functions properly and the exchanges must be designed to de deliver such a current exchanges are designed to accept a maximum loop resistance of 1300 ohms in special circumstances additional line equipments may be installed to drive 2400 ohms loops so a bonded on the loop resistance in turn limits the loop length for a given gauge of wire the dc loop resistance rdc for copper conductors can be calculated from the formula rdc equal to 21.96 by d square ohms per kilometer where d is the diameter of the conductor in mm it is both unnecessary and expensive to provide a dedicated pair for every subscriber three techniques are used to gain on the number pairs first one is party lines second is concentrators and third one is carrier systems in the first technique two or more subscribers are connected to one line which is termed party line this scheme is not useful generally as it has a number of drawbacks only one subscriber at a time can use the line selective ringing is diff difficult and privacy is not maintained dialing between two subscribers on the same line is not possible discuss on the issues on subscriber loop and how to cover subscribers too far away a need often arises to connect to an existing exchange subscribers who are located beyond the maximum prescribed distance for example it is uneconomical to install a new exchange for a alone or a few remote subscribers in such cases special techniques are used to meet the resistance and attenuation constraints the dc resistance constraint is met by first one the use of high diameter or a low gauge wire second use of equalized telephone sets and third one unique gauge design or a use of higher supply voltage in the second technique a concentrator expander ce is used near the cluster of users and another one at the exchange end as shown in the figure only a few junction lines are run between the ce's which have switching capability typically a ratio of 1 is to 10 between the junction lines and the subscriber lines is used the ce at the exchange end remotely powers and controls the ce at the subscriber end the first technique for using higher diameter copper wire is rarely restored to equalized telephone sets require about 8 to 12 milliamps of dc bias current as against 22 to 30 milliamps required by a normal telephone as a result a large value of loop resistance is acceptable the typical uni gauge design is shown in the figure this design accepts to use a wire which is which has a small a diameter as possible while retaining the resistance and attenuation limits the issues on subscriber loop which consists of signaling and voice transmission on the subscriber lines requires that the exchange performs a set of functions these functions are performed by an interface at the exchange end known as subscriber loop interface some functions are required in analog networks some in digital networks and others in both the complete set of functions are known by the term bors cht which stands for b for battery feed o for over voltage protection r for ringing s for supervision c for coding h for hybrid and t for testing functions b and r are well known over voltage protection 
deals with the equipment and personal protection from lightning strikes and power line surges. Detection of conditions is a supervisory function. Functions C and H are exclusive to digital switch interfaces. As we know, digital switching demands that analog to digital and digital to analog conversions and some form of coding decoding be done. Subscribers are connected to the exchange via two wire circuits. The figure shown above is the unigauge design of subscriber loop which consists of for long and short distances the same gauge wire is used and hence the name unigauge design for up to 5 kilometers a 48 volts battery is used with 26 gauge wire and for longer distances a combination of I battery voltage that is 72 or 96 volts and an amplifier that gives a mid band gain of 5 dB is used. Beyond 8 kilometers loading coils are required to obtain better frequency versus attenuation characteristics. The role of loading coil in improving frequency response has been taken by a standard and the below circuit which is a balanced circuit connection. This circuit uses a balanced con connection which overcomes many drawbacks of unbalanced circuits. The transmission lines have equal impedance to ground and hence do not act as an antenna to pick up signals. Such the ground is not part of the signal path hum is eliminated. Differential inputs improve noise immunity as any interference affects both lines equally and does not introduce differential currents. Under the topic of switching hierarchy and routing, we discuss about the interconnection of switching exchanges. Here Telephone networks require some form of interconnection of switching exchanges to route traffic efficiently and economically. Exchanges are interconnected by groups of trunk lines, usually known as trunk groups, that carry traffic in one direction. Two trunk groups are required between any two exchanges. Three basic models are adapted for interconnecting exchanges. Those are MES, STAR and Hierarchy. MES is a very fully connected network. The number of trunk groups in a MES network is proportional to the square of the exchanges being interconnected. As a result, MES connections are used only when there is heavy traffic among exchanges as happened in the metropolitan areas. The topologies adapted in telephone networks. Mainly in star network, there are a tandem exchange is employed. All other exchanges communicate through tandem exchange suitable for low traffic applications. Whereas in hierarchical network, there are a multi-level star connections available and the number of trunk groups can be minimized. Figures shows the star and hierarchical networks. A star connection utilizes an intermediate exchange called a tandem exchange through which all other exchanges communicate. A star configuration is shown in figure. A star network are used when the traffic levels are comparatively low. Many star networks may be interconnected by using an additional tandem exchange leading to a two-level star network. An orderly construction of multi-level star networks leads to hierarchical networks. A hierarchical network are capable of handling heavy traffic where required and at the same time use minimal 
number of trunk groups. A file level switching hierarchy is recommended by CCITT as shown in figure. In a strictly hierarchical network, traffic from subscriber A to subscriber B and vice versa flow through the highest level of hierarchy via quaternary centers as shown in the figure. A traffic route via the highest level of hierarchy is known as the final route whereas if there is a high traffic intensity between any pair of exchanges direct trunk groups may be established between them as shown by dashed lines in the figure. These direct routes are known as high usage routes. Wherever high usage routes exist, the traffic is primarily routed through them. Overflow traffic, if any, is routed along the hierarchical path. No overflow is permitted from the final route. In the figure, the first choice routing for traffic between subscriber A and B is via the high usage route across the primary centers. The second and the third choice routes and the final route are also indicated in the figure. A hierarchical system of routing leads to simplified switch design. Three methods are commonly used for deciding on the route for a particular connection. Those are first one is write through routing, second one is own exchange routing and the third one is computer controlled routing. Coming to routing methods, the first one is write through routing. The original exchange determines the complete route from source to destination. There are a number of predefined routes. A route is selected based on certain criteria such as time of the day or distribution of the traffic etc. No routing decisions are taken at the intermediate exchanges or nodes. In write through routing the originating exchange determines the complete route from source to destination. No routing decisions are taken at the intermediate routes. In the absence of a computer, only a predefined route can be chosen by the originating exchange. However, there may be a more than one predefined route and the originating node may select one out of these based on certain criteria like time of the day or even distribution of traffic etc. In routing methods, the second one is own exchange distributed routing. Here an alternative routes can be chosen at the intermediate nodes capable of responding to changes in traffic loads and network configurations and also minimal modifications are required when new exchanges are added. The figure shown is own exchange or distributed routing. Here in own exchange routing or distributed routing allows alternative routes to be chosen at the intermediate nodes. Thus the strategy is capable of responding to changes in traffic loads and network configurations. Another advantage of distributed routing is that when new exchanges are added, modifications required in the switch are minimal. The third method of routing is computer controlled routing. Based on the use of common channel signaling systems called as CCS and in CCS there is a separate computer controlled signaling network a number of routing methods can be implemented. The third method is computer controlled routing. Here routing decisions are made by an independent signaling network. The computers are used in networks with common channel signaling features. In CCS there is a separate computer controlled signaling network. With computers in position, a number of sophisticated route selection methods 
can be implemented. Computers based routing is a standard feature in data networks. A strictly hierarchical network suffers from one serious drawback that is its poor fault tolerance feature. A good network design should maintain communication through maybe with reduced capability and increased blockage even in the event of a failure of one or several links due to causes such as fire or natural disaster. Total breakdown of the network should never occur unless under calamity. In a hierarchical network, as we go higher in the hierarchy, the nodes of each rank become fewer and fewer. A failure of a node or communication link links at higher level might seriously cause problem to the communications. Alternative root, routing paths and reductant nodes have to be provided for in higher levels. The current tendency is to reduce the number of levels in the hierarchy and fully interconnect the high level modes to provide a large number of alternative routes. It is expected that the future national networks must be built with only three levels of hierarchy. Transmission plan. Here for reasons of transmission quality and efficiency of operation of signaling, it is desirable to limit the number of circuits connected in tandem. In a tandem chain, the number of links between national and international circuits is necessary to ensure quality telecommunications. The CCITT lays down certain guidelines in this regard in its recommendations called as Q40. There are three points which must be taken. The first one is the maximum number of circuits to be used in an international call is 12 and the second point is no more than four international circuits be used in tandem between the originating and the terminating international switching centers and the third point is in exceptional cases for a low number of calls the total number of circuits may be 14 but even in this case the international circuits are limited to a certain value of maximum of 4. Taking the guidelines of above two points, we have eight links available for national circuits, which implies a limit of four for each national circuit. National network designs should taken into the consideration for these limits. The factors in transmission loss budget are the first one is line loss and the second one is switch loss third one is echo level and fourth one is signaling echo level we discuss about talker is disturbed an important function of the hybrid is to ensure that the received signal is not coupled the coupling is zero only when the two wire circuit and the four wire circuit impedances are perfectly matched. While it is relatively easy to control the impedances of the trunk circuits, the subscriber loop impedances vary from subscriber to subscriber depending on the length at which a subscriber is located from the exchange. As a result, an impedance mismatch occurs for most of the connections at the subscriber line trunk interface. The effect of such a mismatch is to reflect a part of the incoming speech signal onto the outgoing circuit. 
which returns to the speaker as echo. The echo may be loud enough to annoy the speaker as it is amplified like other signals in the written path. However, it may not be as strong as the speech signal from the other party since it experiences attenuation on two lengths of the transmission channel before reaching the originator. And the measures taken that are attenuator for short delay echoes less than 50 milliseconds and echo suppressor long delay echoes greater than 50 milliseconds and echo canceller for long delay echoes greater than 50 milliseconds. We discuss on the attenuator for short delay echoes that is less than 50 ms. If the distance are short, the round trip delay experienced by the echo is small such that the echo superimposes on the speaker's own voice and becomes unnoticeable. In fact, the side tone may be considered as echo with zero delay. As the time delay increases, the echo becomes noticeable and annoying to the speaker.